it fails the ver a horizontal line test infinitely bad. So we had to trim down the, do the domain of tangent, which turned into the range of the inverse function. So we, I basically graphed f right here, the original f, which is 3 tan, uh, and then the 2 and the minus pi is going to affect the period, and, and the minus 1. So we trimmed down the domain of f, and that trimmed down domain was the range of f inverse. Now, your question was, what about the domain of the inverse function, which is the range of the original? So tangent's a little, uh, it's very easy to see the uh, range of the regular tangent function. Even with our transformations, our range was infinity, negative infinity to positive infinity. That won't be the case with sine and cosine inverse. Uh, also with secant and cosecant. So let me graph just a generic, uh, was it a sine or a cosine or secant or cosecant problem? Uh, cosine. cosine. So I'm just going to graph a cosine function with some transformations in it okay. without writing down the formula. And then we'll write down the, uh, we'll cut the domain to force it to be one to one, and then we'll look at the range. So I'm going to be given the graph of uh, y equals f of x. So we're going to have to make some choices. Uh, so we're going to uh, restrict domain. of f to make f one to one. So looking at this, f's not one to one, and we need to restrict the domain. So what is a good starting x value to look for uh, when we go in the domain? Like I could start at 14, but that's a little silly. We're gonna try to start at zero, and then go as far as we can both directions. So I'm starting at zero. Now if we look at this, I can go both directions a little bit and still be one to one or still pass horizontal line test. So the question is how far can I go? So how far can I go to the right? I can't go all the way to seven. Now I don't have the x value labeled. It looks like I can go to right here. So it should be halfway, which will be 3.5. We go decimals and I can do the same thing going to the left. I go to the top, the peak right there, to the maximum, minus 3.5. So there's our, and then we're going to throw out all that extra stuff right there. So our domain of f, which we started right down, domain f is close negative 3.5 to positive 3.5. Now I didn't label y values. Let's uh, Let's do something crazy like a 2 pi and minus 2 pi. This is a little bit weird because if it was actually 2 pi and minus 2 pi, we'd have a vertical stretch of 2 pi. So it's strange to see pi is up on the y-axis. So any questions on the domain of f? Now this is, this is the range of f inverse. So domain of f is the range of f inverse. So that's the one property of this function. Now what about the range of f? Not f inverse, but the range of f. So what outputs can this function have? And you can look at the graph and tell me what outputs does this function have? This, of course, this graph is y equals f of x. So what outputs does this function, can this function have? Negative 2 pi. Yep, everything from negative 2 pi to 2 pi.
and this is the domain of f inverse. So if I know the range of the original, that's the domain of the inverse. So you need to know what is the, do what is the range of your original function that they gave you. And that all has to only do with the uh, vertical stretch and shift. So I didn't have any shift on this, so, but if I shifted it up one or two, it would just move that interval up or down one or two. So if you can answer the domain range of your original, you just swap the two domain range and you have your inverse. And that'll work any of the six trig functions. Even if I, I did a cosecant or uh, secant inverse, you would graph the regular cosecant function. They have a weird range. I don't think, I, I wouldn't put this on a quiz, but a really quick graph of these functions looks something like that. So you would go from So our range would be, if we go negative first, cosecant and uh, secant have this range right here. It's a little weird because there's two pieces in these functions. Um, I'd have to be very careful about the domain though and cut that up nicely. The reason that this function is so uh, difficult is that it's not one to one right here. So if I restrict the domain, I actually have have to go and pick these points right here and then throw away that part right there. So that's why these get a little more tricky. So there's really two pieces to the domain. There's a left piece and a right piece. So these functions are a little extra tricky. That's why I generally don't do them. All right, we're going to do one last algebra example here. So this question just says solve. There are two letters. There's an X and a pi. Well, there's an SIN as well. What of those five letters are we trying to solve for? I wish it was pi. We'd be done. All right, don't solve for S or I or N. This is all code together. So we're trying to solve for X. All right, so you know PEMDAS, so what is the first thing I should do to solve? So I got no addition, subtraction, I have multiplication, division. So get that three out of there. Now I can flip it around. What is sine pi over three? Yes, it is x. <laughs> what is x? Uh, how do you go from uh, sine negative 1 x equals pi over 3 to x equals sine of x? So we're using the inverse function. Okay. So we're moving the function to the other side. So if I write it with x's and y's, what happened? This was basically f inverse of x equals y. That's the same if you move the function to the other side. It goes as the opposite or the inverse function. So that's the inverse function property right there. That's what it means to be an inverse. Outputs become inputs, inputs become outputs. All right, there's only one answer right here. Root 3 over 2. So that's x right there. x equals that, which is square root 3 over 2. Oh, is this 10.6? I think it is 10.6. Yep. All right. This is a good time to move to the next page. We're still going to be in 10.6, but we're going to call it more inverse trig functions. So I've gone over Sokotoa before, opposite adjacent hypotenuse. That's, okay, 
a few nods. So we're gonna use these properties right here. Now, secant and cosecant are the reciprocals of cosine and sine. So you could write the acronym further out if you wanted to include all those as well, but we're just gonna use the reciprocal properties that we know about. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna mix trig functions together. So we're gonna find the exact value of sine of tangent inverse of one half. So here it's important to remember that sine, let's see who's, so sine is expecting an angle right here. So the inside of this is supposed to be an angle. And also you can think, well, what is tangent inverse supposed to output is an angle. So what I underlined is an angle. So I'm going to let theta equal tan inverse one half. I'm going to show you two ways to solve this. One way is algebraic and one way is geometrical with triangles. We're going to go with the uh, geometric way first. Now we're going to use TOA but we need to first turn this to a regular tangent not tangent inverse. So we're going to move tangent to the other side. So this is the same thing as tan theta equals one half. Now we know tangent is opposite over adjacent. And we're gonna draw a triangle. Opposite is one, adjacent is two. There's some good news here. You don't have to worry about negatives anymore what quadrant you're in with these questions. There's only gonna be one uh, answer to this. You don't have to worry if it's positive or negative. It will just come out automatically. So, uh, let's see. What I just underlined, I called theta right there. Tangent inverse one half is theta. So we have our triangle with theta, sine. So I need to know what is sine theta sine is opposite over hypotenuse. Opposite is one, uh-oh, what's hypotenuse? All right, so figure out hypotenuse. Should only take you about 10 seconds if you know what you're doing. So let's go square root of the other two squared added together. So Pythagorean theorem. So h equals square root two squared plus one squared equals square root five. So that's sine theta, which is what we were looking for right here, sine theta. So geometry using triangles is, in my opinion, the fastest way to solve these to reduce them. So if you're an algebra person, so let's go the algebra route now. So this is geometry. Let's go algebra. So we still the same first step. Let theta equal tan, it looks like tom, tan inverse. inverse one half, so we can flip that around, same thing. Now what am I looking for? I'm looking for sine theta. Just like before, except I don't want to use a triangle to get there. Is there a way to relate tangent and sine together? So what are some identities that you know to relate tangent to other stuff? Now, there's only one identity I can think of that has tangent and sine in it. What is that one? It's not on your cheat sheet. 
tangent sine over cosine. So I'm going to write down stuff we know. So here's the worst thing you can do. Why is that very wrong? Tangent was 1 over 2. So what's very wrong with cosine equals 2? Yeah, it's too big. The biggest you can get is 1 or negative 1. So this it's true that sine over cosine equals 1 half, but you can't say that sine is 1 and cos is 2. That's not correct. So what I can say is 1 half equals sine over cosine. What I'm not allowed to say is that means sine is 1 and cos is 2. There's no theta value that gives 1 for sine and 2 for cosine. So I can cross multiply because fractions are scary. So that's some easy algebra right there. Cos theta is 2 sine theta. So if I knew sine, cosine is twice as big. Or if I knew cosine, I could say 1 half cosine equals sine theta. Unfortunately, I don't actually know either one of these two. I just know if I, if I found one, the other one's either twice as big or half as big. So I know how they're related. What's another identity that relates tangent squared to something else? Also not on your cheat sheet. Seek it squared, or seek and seek it. All right, that's a Pythagorean identity you need to know. Uh, unfortunately, we don't really have secant, though. But I could write secant as 1 over cosine. So let's write secant as 1 over cosine. And let's plug in all of our numbers, and we'll figure out what cos theta is going to be. Once we know cos theta, I'm going to multiply it by a half, and we got sine theta. So we're going to figure out cos theta first, and then make it half as big, and we have sine theta. So we're going to find cos theta. So we said tangent was 1 half. So 1 half squared is 1 fourth plus 4 fourths is 1 over cos squared theta. So that is 5 fourths. So from here, the best way to solve for cos theta, let's take the reciprocal of both sides. So 4 fifths equals cos squared theta over 1 and then square root both sides. Now we have to figure out plus or minus. This is where it can become a little more tricky. So let's think about cosine. Where is cosine negative? So if cosine gave me a negative value, what quadrants would cosine be in? Or what, what quadrants would theta be in? So it'd be on the left side. So if we're on the left, cos is negative, which is 2, uh, two or 3. And if we're on the right, that's 1 and 4. So it's going to become a little bit tricky here.
What is the range of tangent inverse? What type of outputs does tangent inverse have? That would be the domain. It would be all real numbers. Yep, negative pi over 2 to positive pi over 2. All right, so that cuts down where it can come from. Negative pi over 2, positive pi over 2. Negative pi over 2, positive pi over 2. That throws out those two quadrants right there. So cos theta has to be positive now because our original theta has to be in quadrant 4 or 1 from that property. So cos theta is greater than 0. We're going with the plus. So now 1 half times 2 over square root 5 is sine theta and just cancel the 2's. 1 over square root 5 equals sine theta. Generally, the algebraic way to get there is going to take longer. And you're going to have to do a little more thinking. So I recommend triangles. You can get there either way, but you're going to have to break out your, I believe almost every question you're going to have to use the Pythagorean identities that have the squared trig functions in them. And you may have to think about positives and negatives, and inverses and domains and ranges. So I would stick to triangles instead of using algebra. If you had extra time to kill, you can go back and figure it out with algebra if you want to check your answer instead of take a nap after your quiz. But generally, going with triangles is going to be faster. So make sure you read these correctly. This does not say cosine of cosine inverse. This is cosecant of cosine inverse. So I'm only going to go the triangle way. I'm not going to go the algebra way this time. So we do the same starting move. Let theta equal cos inverse negative 1 7th. So flip this around. Cos theta equals negative one seventh. Now, negative one seventh, I don't know what type of theta is going to give me that. But before we go on, is negative one seventh too big for cosine to output? It's weird when we talk about negative numbers. What is the biggest negative number cosine can output? So it's going to go all the way down to negative one. This is only negative one seventh, so no problem. Cosine can output negative one seventh. If this was seven, that's a different story. We would say no, uh, it would be undefined. So we're going to draw our triangle now. You don't need to worry about uh, what quadrant you draw it in. It doesn't even have to be lined up with the xy axis. Cosine is adjacent over hypotenuse. Now there is one thing you have to always remember. No matter what, hypotenuse should never be negative. And I think I've said this before, hypotenuse always is going to be, the smallest it could ever be is zero. It's a silly triangle. If your hypotenuse is ever equal to zero, your whole triangle is a point. So it's pretty boring if your hypotenuse is zero. So we can pretty much say it's not going to be equal to zero. It's going to be greater than zero. All right, so what this means is adjacent's negative 1, hypotenuse is positive 7. That's why I'm making this clear. So adjacent side, negative 1, hypotenuse 7. How do I get the opposite side? O is a bad letter to use. 
let's go p. So I'm going to call this side p for opposite. Oh, it looks like a zero. That's why it's not a good letter variable to use. It'll look just like a zero. So how do I get p? Pythagorean theorem. Now we have to decide, should it be positive or negative? So that comes from where theta, so theta comes from cos inverse, right here. So what is the range of cos inverse? So let's pretend that you forgot. I have no idea what the range of cos inverse is. I wasn't here Friday or Thursday or wasn't paying attention. So where did cos inverse come from? It came from the cosine function. And cosine starts at 1. So what is the domain of our cosine function? So obviously it starts at 0. Where does it end? Regular cosine function. Pi, half a period. You keep going, you get back to two pi right there. So this is just regular cosine graph. I just restricted it to be one to one. So that means the range of cosine inverse is zero to pi. It's the domain of the regular function, except it's now the range. So what quadrant, so this triangle could be in two, one of two quadrants. We're either in quadrant one or quadrant two. I drew the triangle as if it was in quadrant one. What quadrant is this triangle really in? It can't be in three. It can't be in four. It's got to be in two. Why is that? Because it was a negative adjacent side. So this triangle has to be in quadrant two. So that means my P is positive square root. It's not in quadrant three, so it's not going to be negative. So I have my triangle. We can finally answer our original question here. So I want to know what is cosecant theta. So cosecant is uh, 1 over sine. So that's hypotenuse over, so over opposite. So hypotenuse is 7. Opposite is square root 48. And there is cosecant theta. Now, a shortcut that I believe always works whenever you're doing these problems, you can go with the positive version. So whenever there's a plus minus choice on these problems, you can just choose positive. It's nice to know why, which if you carefully look at where theta comes from, you'll know exactly what quadrant it's in. Uh, no matter what, your domain's restricted down to two quadrants. One of them will give you a positive, one will give you a negative. And you just have to decide which of those two are we in. And every single restricted domain, no matter what, included quadrant one. Some of them are one and two. Some of the restricted domains are one and four. You're never in quadrant three. So you're never going to get a double negative. You're never going to have negative opposite and adjacent. So no matter what, you can always throw out quadrant three on these problems. It's a little tricky at the side, are we in two or four if you have a negative, but 
you can get that by just knowing where these trig functions came from when we cut the domains up. And that narrows it down quickly. And now we're into the next real section, which is 10.7. And this is solving trig equations and inequalities. So we're going to go for equations first. They're always easier than inequalities. And I'm going to do these by just going through examples. So there's really no theory at all going on. We're just going to go and solve them with examples. And we're going to start very easy. So this one is, there's really no algebra we need to do. Solve cosine theta equals 1 half. What's one theta value that should already be in your head? Pi over what? Pi over 3. So pi over 3 is the first one that comes into my brain. All right, one half is an x value. Oh, it's not a very good circle. One half is an x value. So my brain just thought of this angle right here, pi over 3. Is that the only point on the unit circle that has an x coordinate of 1 half? What's the other theta value that has x coordinate of 1 half? There's two names for it, at least. So if we go the scenic route, what's that angle? Five pi over three? If we go the scenic route. What if we go the short route this way? Negative pi over three. So there's three angles when I take their cosine, I get one half. Can you think of a fourth angle that has a cosine value of one half? How about going the scenic route this way? That is negative five pi over three. What if I do a full rotation and then pick any one of these? What if I do 99 full rotations and then do another one of these? All right, so there's infinite answers. So how do we line them all up? If we look at the unit circle, there's really two points on the unit circle. All I have to do is name every single uh, angle that gets me to those two points. So let's draw a cleaner unit circle. We'll pick the best angle to get there. So just give me one name. So the first one we all said was pi over 3. Just give me one nice name for that bottom angle. Negative pi over 3. So we're going to use these two angles, and we're just going to add as many rotations as we want. So we're going to use either angle, or really both, angle and add uh, as many periods, which in our case is 2 pi, where we have cosine, so we're going to add um, as many periods as we want. Well, I should say an arbitrary number of periods.
So we start with theta equals pi over 3 plus 2 pi k. And the other one is theta equals negative pi over 3 plus 2 pi k. And we have to say what k is. where k is any integer. So there's our full answer. It either is pi over 3 plus as many rotations as you want, or negative pi over 3 plus as many rotations as you want. So if you prefer English to writing math, you can write where k is any integer, if that works better for you. Uh, it's tempting to say whole numbers, but I believe whole numbers are defined to be the positive integers, sometimes including 0. But the integers are all positive, negative whole numbers and 0. So we're going to go with integers. So it's really important that you understand this one, because what we're going to do is do uh, solve some problems that have more algebra steps involved that are all based on this idea right here. So any questions on this one before we move on? We're just picking unit points on the unit circle and then giving all the names of those points. So one word about notation, function notation, we start to get lazy and leave off parentheses. So we don't always write parentheses, especially for the trig functions, because we know sine is a function. And it operates on what's to the right of sine. So if you see sine theta, what that really means is sine, the input is theta, sine of theta. And if you see. So this is just some notes about notation. If you see sine theta plus square root 3, that is sine of theta add square root 3 after you take the sine. If I wanted to add square root 3 before I take sine, I have to use parentheses. So this is not the same as sine theta plus square root 3. So if you want to include that addition in there, you have to write out explicitly parenthesizing the input. So functions, any function, operates on the expression to the right. So we've almost exclusively used f's and parentheses before. So if I want f to eat not x, but double, like 2x, I want to double the x before I feed it to f, I have to use parentheses like this. If it's, we don't usually write function notation with f's, but if I just write f 2x, technically f eats the expression to the right. So this is really f of 2 multiplied by x. So I wouldn't write out something like this, but just technically that would be f of 2 multiplied by x. Now, of course, with trig functions, we get lazy because I don't really know why. There's not a good reason. With regular trig functions, unfortunately, when I write this, what I actually mean is sine of the whole thing to theta. So whenever in doubt, use extra parentheses. And if, you're, if I give you a, for example, on a quiz, if I write sine theta plus theta, I probably meant add the thetas and then take sine of them. 
but I will try on all quizzes to write extra parentheses so you know exactly what is inputs. So trig functions have bad notation. And unfortunately, that's just something that has been going on for uh, quite a while since function notation has been around, I don't know, maybe 200 years or so. Trig functions have just had bad notation. So the point I'm making is plus 3 is not part of the input. So we're going to do, do PEMDAS when in doubt. You're going up the PEMDAS. So algebra, you go up. And arithmetic, generally going down PEMDAS. So what should I do first? We're trying to solve for theta. So I want to get theta by itself. So we're trying to rescue theta and get everything else out of here. So get that square root 3 out. Now get the 2 out by multiplying by a half. And now we can think about what theta values, what points on the unit circle. In this case, we're doing sine. So I have a y value of negative 3, uh, square root 3 over 2. So draw your unit circle. So I need a y value, negative square root 3 over 2. That's basically the last stop I know about. There's going to be two y values, or two, one y value, but two points on the unit circle that have that y value right there. So easy question, what is that first if I go counterclockwise, what's the, if I go regular clockwise, what's that first stop right there that I labeled? So it'll be negative pi over 3 if I go the short route, not the scenic route. Now, I don't think there's a standard way to label the second point there. You could either go the long way or the short way. doesn't really matter which way you go. I'm going to go, just to make the diagram clean, I'm going to go the long way. What is a long way around to get to that other third quadrant angle? So you could think this is pi over 3. What I just wrote down is pi over 3. So I need to go 3 pi over 3 and then another pi over 3. So that would be 4 pi over 3. OK. So we're writing out. Uh, oops, don't need to write sign theta equals negative pi over 3 plus 2 pi k, or theta equals 4 pi over 3 plus 2 pi k, where k is any integer. Yes, but you're, so there's an infinite no, way, number of ways to label these two angles. You have to, you have to, yeah, you have to go with the correct name for it. So I think negative pi over three could have been five pi over three. 